Not yet. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Real Crusades History. This is going to be our live stream about the Sixth Crusade. So I'm here with Rand Brown. Rand, how you doing, my friend? Not bad. It's always great to be here. Great. And we got Scott Amos here. Scott, how are you doing, sir? I'm just fine. Uh, same thing as Rand. Nice to be here. And uh, the lady of the hour for this one is going to be uh, Helena Schroeder, who is with us, the author of the new novel, Rebels Against Tyranny, which deals with Frederick II's crusade, known as the Sixth Crusade, as well as the subsequent civil war that ensued between his faction and the barons of Outremer. So, uh, Helena, glad to have you with us. How are you doing? It's a pleasure to be here, as always. Thank you. Great. So we decided to do an old school Real Crusades history podcast where we break down a particular crusade. And, you know, of course, we've done the first crusade, the third, the fourth. We're going to do the sixth crusade now. So let's uh, let's take a look at that one. That's a pretty interesting crusade. Uh, it's maybe it's it's maybe one that's a little bit less uh, focused on. Now, one thing I've noticed is, uh, actually, Scott and I were talking about this the other day, that the most popular crusades seem to be the first, third, and fourth in terms of the numbered crusades. Okay. And the sixth crusade kind of, uh, it's one of the most unique crusades, though, because it doesn't really involve any actual fighting. So uh, the most famous uh, member, of course, of this crusade, uh, the man who led it and uh, made it so... Um, such a controversial event is, of course, Emperor Frederick II, one of the most noteworthy Holy Roman emperors in history. A uh, really fascinating historical figure. He, he uh, plays a big role in Helena's latest novel, uh, Rebels Against Tyranny. So we're going to talk about all of that stuff right now. So let's introduce the Sixth Crusade a little bit here. Um, the dates for the Sixth Crusade are 1228 to 1229, but the roots of it really go back quite a bit further than that. Like, I think we really have to look at the Fifth Crusade and mm -hmm. its failure and how that kind of led to the... Oh, I'm sorry. Helen, are, did you have something to add? The roots are going to go back to 1215 when the young Frederick II takes the cross at his coronation as King of the Romans. That's what yes. he first promises to go on crusade. So it predates the Fifth Crusade. And he retakes that vow in 1220 when he's crowned by the Pope as Holy Roman Emperor, which again predates essentially the Fifth Crusade. Yeah, and one thing I've noticed about Frederick II is he seems to have promised to go on crusade more often than just about anybody. It's, it's pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, so do you want to give us a little bit of background, uh, Helena, about you know uh, Frederick's initial vow, how he he initially was supposed to be uh, leading the Fifth Crusade to be there? Yeah. Um, but yeah, go I ahead. Think, I think Tell us. No, about I think that. you said that's. I just wanted to raise that. I wanted to say that he had made the vow in 1215, and he retakes the vow in 1220, um, and and that as you say, he takes the vow again in 1225 and promises it'll no later than 1227 and he'll accept excommunication if he doesn't and then he doesn't make that date either but i think why don't you go ahead i'll let the rest of you talk about the fifth crusade uh what's that i i'm pa perfectly happy to have the rest of you talk a little bit about the fifth crusade well you know i didn't want to get too deep into the fifth crusade uh it is it is a fascinating one though just because okay so this is of course the big debut of the actual attempt to to uh capture egypt from i mean of course there was uh almeric's campaigns back in the 12th century but in terms of one of the numbered crusades this is when uh um that really gets going and it's it's kind of a, a messy crusade it's it's uh the main leader is uh, pelagius who was uh the papal legate so this is one of the first times that uh the papacy tried to really take a direct control over a crusade. And um, a lot of leaders came and went throughout it. So we've got guys like uh, Andrew of Hungary and um, just a wide variety of uh, important leaders who come in and out of uh, the action of the Fifth Crusade. But it ends up 
pretty much um, in this big uh, letdown where, you know, initially they captured Damietta, which is uh, this coastal city that sort of opens the gateway to, to Egypt. And uh, then there's this push uh, to, to go for Cairo, and that just does not work out. Um, I don't know. Does anybody want to go any deeper into the, into the Fifth Crusade? Or? I, okay, I will, I will take a stab at this. That saying what's very important about the Fifth Crusade is that it's focusing on taking control of Egypt, which is controlled by Al-Kamil, mm -hmm. one of the Ayyubids. And he makes the first, this is the first time that he makes the offer to surrender literally all of the former kingdom of Jerusalem in, the, in its entirety mm -hmm. to the crusaders in exchange for the getting back Damietta. Except for uh, the castles, uh, the Transjordan castles, correct? Actually, I don't know. Let's, let's just, it doesn't matter because though all of Tran Well, all it kind of does. No, because all of the former kingdom of Jerusalem belongs to his brother. So it's like the king of France saying, you can have all of England, including Scotland, really, truly, you can have it all. <laughs> because he doesn't control it. Uh. So, but this is the first time that that offer is made. And there's far too many historians who look at that and say, look how stupid the crusaders were. They didn't take this great deal. Well, it wasn't such a great deal because al Kamil didn't control it. Although at that time he was actually in alliance with his brother. So it was a little bit more viable. Well, and the other thing too was uh, they did press for uh, the Transjordan castles and uh, at no point were any of the Ayyubids willing to give those up. And that was of course the, uh, from the perspective of the Templars and the military orders, uh, without those, you can't defend Jerusalem. And of course we're, we're going to get into that some more with the Sixth Crusade. So there, there are a lot of good reasons to not have taken that offer. Yeah, go ahead, Rand. And, and I think uh, another very important point to bring up, and this is one that um, uh, John Gillingham in his uh, biography on Richard the uh, First, his his masterful biography of Richard the uh, First, brings up is that um, the 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 recognition that Egypt was the real power base. For the for the Ayyubids, uh, and, and that was where future military efforts needed to be focused, was something that was already recognized clear back at the Third Crusade. Um, Richard, uh, it, it's it's very likely that Richard was had that in mind uh, when he made his push towards Ascalon and, and places like that, in in order to sever the, the 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 logistics and communication lines between Egypt and and Palestine. Um, and uh, that there was there, there's a significant amount of evidence, or at least it's very easy to to, to assume that Richard uh, had planned if he had survived, if he had not uh, met with his um, unfortunate death at Shalu Castle, um, that he had planned to if he had ever returned to the Holy Land that Egypt was going to be his focus, um, and that uh, so it, it's I think that strategic plan continued on with the subsequent fifth and sixth crusades that that was still very much the idea that hey we, we need to take e if we really want to secure palestine we need to take egypt out it was a it was a it was a brilliant strategic plan that just unfortunately at the at the tactical and the operational level was just horribly executed um yeah, and I think we've kind of already uh, hinted at the incredible disunity in the Ayyubid world that existed at this time. Uh, the Fifth Crusade, uh, at the end of it, actually had been this rare occasion since Saladin's demise where there was this uh, coming together of, uh, at this point we've got the Ayyubid world is mostly in the control of the sons of Al-Adil, who is uh, Saladin's brother. Saladin's sons had actually pretty much all been disinherited, but um, yeah, Al Kamil, who um, controlled Egypt, and then Al Muazzam, who controlled Damascus, and then I'm I don't remember exactly what Al Ashraf controlled. I know he was kind of going back and forth between the two Aleppo, major Aleppo, factions. Aleppo Mosul, I presume. Okay, yeah, um, but but yeah, so. They kind of come together to defeat that Crusader army that's that's pushing for Cairo, and at that point again, there's sort of this breakdown in uh, in their ability to cooperate, and that's pretty much the theme throughout the 13th century for the Ayyubids. And you know, as as we just 
kind of hinted at there's it's just gets very complicated with the aobids and who controls what and what factions are you know allied with one another or whatever at what point but um and um yeah so once the papacy of gregory the ninth begins uh he once again um, is is pressing for Frederick II to uh, to depart on crusade, and I think at this point they settle on twelve twenty seven, which we we touched on that a little bit already. But yeah, it's pretty interesting at this point. I mean, he's been talking about going on crusade, like Helena was saying, since twelve fifteen, and I, and I think you know this is an interesting point too in crusades history because we're getting to the point where crusading is such an institution that mm-hmm. it's it's kind of become this obligatory thing for the monarchs of Europe to take an interest in uh, the, the business of, uh, mm-hmm. of the Holy land as they called it. And, uh, and, you know, there's been this long time debate about whether or not Frederick the second was really even a very sincere crusader. You know, Helen, I know you and I kind of talked about this uh, last time in terms of this oh. idea, this sort of phony idea that he was sort of a proto modern monarch, but <laughs> Did, did wait, you, you mean wait? You mean you, you mean Nietzsche was wrong? He wasn't the first European. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, yeah. But um, I wanted to ask you, Helena, if if you wanted to talk a little bit about Frederick's, you know, th- at this point when he actually kind of is about to to head out, maybe touch on his his conflict with the papacy, and I, I'd like to get a little bit of your perspective too, just on what you think his motivations were and, and, you know, how, how sincere of a crusader he really was even. I think Frederick, this, I'm going to call, I'm going to come fly out and say, I think that Frederick's main motivation for going to the Holy land was to, because he'd already been in contact with Al Camille was to get control of Jerusalem as a way of shaming the Pope. And it was part, it was a move in his chess game with the Pope. It had nothing to do with the Holy Land. It had nothing to do with securing Jerusalem, it had nothing to do with sustainable security for the Crusader states. It was all about the photo op, a medieval form of the photo op of him in the Holy Sepulchre with the crown of Jerusalem on his head. It was a one upsmanship against the Pope. Whether he had been sincere about crusading in 1215, whether he'd been sincere about crusading in 1220, I don't know Frederick II well enough to make that judgment. But by the time he'd been excommunicated in 1227, after putting out to sea with the remnants of a devastated army that was already decimated by plague or dysentery or some such thing, um, and then the Pope went ahead and excommunicated him, Frederick consistently looked at doing something that would discredit Gregory the Ninth, right? Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, who just moaned? I don't know. Is everybody okay? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. I didn't hear anything. Yeah. Um, Me. You know. Yeah, I think that I think that's that's a good point. And uh, well, I don't want to jump too much into uh, the condition he actually leaves the Holy Land in uh, once once he heads out, but. Uh, but that does that is pretty uh, revelatory in a lot of this. And but, well, I guess my, maybe I have to justify that. That was a very very bold statement. But I'm going to justify that with the with the major point. He did not take very many troops. He had already basically been in touch with Al Camille about the deal he was going to do. He conducted secret negotiations. He did took no military action. The yeah. treaty that concluded, which was only a truce, was never sanctioned by any by the by the militant orders or by the High Court, court of Jerusalem. And then he left the Holy Land in an indefensible state and rushed away and never returned. He spent less than one year in the Holy Land, despite being officially king of Jerusalem. He left the Holy Land in a worse state than when he came because they, they extended the borders without being able to defend them, which meant that they had created indefensible borders. And as I said, what did he do? He spent two days in Jerusalem. He walked around the whole, he, he wore his crown in the church, the Holy Sepulchre, and then he rushed back to the West to say to the, kid, to the Pope, yeah, 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 I'm better than you are. I was in Jerusalem. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, 
there was so much that w- that was of concern to him back in the West. I mean, this this long term conflict between uh, the papacy and the and uh, Frederick the Second. Um, you know, and a, and a big part of that, of course, was the fact that uh, the papacy was uncomfortable with uh, Frederick, you know, basically the Holy Roman Emperor controlling the Holy Roman Empire and Sicily. Yeah. So, so yeah, when he actually leaves for the Holy Land, he is excommunicated because he'd been excommunicated um, the previous year in, in 1227 by uh, for failing to depart at that point. And so it is kind of interesting, like once he actually departs in 1228, it's against the Pope's wishes at this point, which is kind of funny because, you know, he's been uh, he's been supposed to go. And then when he finally goes, the Pope isn't wanting him to leave, Uh, which I guess that even brings up the question of, you know, to what extent is this really a crusade? I mean, you've got uh, the the uh, definition of a crusade that historians give is a campaign that's sanctioned by the papacy with the papal indulgence attached and all that stuff so um but yeah it's not a i agree with it i always try to refer to it as a so-called sixth crusade because it clearly like the fourth crusade does not fulfill the definition mm-hmm. of a happily sanctioned yeah. military yeah and you know the whole center to frederick's crusade is you know like you're talking about helena this this negotiation process with Al Camille, which uh, there's a lot of back and forth to that. Um, do, do you want to talk a little bit about what they were talking about, you know, when they started talking and um, kind of what you think was going on between the two of them? I'm happy to, unless somebody else wants it. I feel like I'm dominating this, but they started the negotiations back before um I'm going to say 12, I don't I'll have to check my book. I think it's 1225 or something that they have the initial contacts. And what's clear is that at the time, the initial contact is made by al Kamil, because he's fighting with his brother, Amu Azim, and um, he's looking for an ally because he's afraid that, as you say, he's going to be outmaneuvered by his brothers. So he looks for an, an ally that would counterbalance his brothers ganging up on him. So Al Kamil is the one who initiates it, but Frederick seizes upon it and clearly sees this as an opportunity, something he can take advantage of, which is perfectly legitimate. There's nothing wrong with negotiating. Let me go back and stress, I mean, Rand's already mentioned Richard I. Richard I also tries to negotiate. Every general is an idiot if he doesn't try to get by treaty what he would have to get with blood. Mm-hmm. Negotiating is a perfectly legitimate uh, tactic to attain military objectives. And, and this is, I think, something which, which actually offends me is that so many historians, say, oh, this wonderful, you know, modern Frederick II, he's willing to, you know, negotiate rather than fight. Well, damn it, you know, your soldier, soldier, Richard I was willing to negotiate. He was negotiating with Saladin from, from Accra onwards. So there's nothing yeah. unusual about negotiating here. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's just uh, the normal course of things throughout the history of the Crusades. I mean the 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 very first the first Crusaders were negotiating with uh, the Egyptians at one point, who were then the Fatimids. I mean this is just the normal course of things, and yeah, all this stuff that's attributed to Frederick, like uh, you know, first of all, the idea of okay, a bloodless Crusade, like somehow that represented some sort of progressive style of warfare or something. Of course, that's ridiculous. I mean, um, and you know. Yeah, throughout the medieval world, powers negotiated with with each other over territory. And on top of that, I mean, I don't think that the deal that Frederick came up with with Al Camille was uh, uh, even that impressive. Like this idea that, and I, I think you know, yeah, this was about showing up the Pope and saying, um, and even you know, to some extent, saying like, uh, I'm the real central figurehead of Christendom. You know, the the Pope is trying to stop me from from doing the work of Christendom. And, you know, we do have to say uh, this, there is a certain, there's an incredible propaganda value to this. I mean, Christendom had been longing to regain control of Jerusalem, you know, ever since uh, Saladin's conquest of it in 1187, you know, that's a long time ago at this point. And 
you know, th this was an emotional thing throughout the Latin West. And I think we can kind of see how Frederick could have looked at this and, and thought, um, okay, yeah, this will be my master stroke to, um, you know, delegitimize the, the Pope's efforts against me. And, uh, you know, I, 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 it's kind of interesting to think about how this news would have traveled around the West. You know, p people are hearing like, um, oh, Jerusalem's been restored. I mean, we know that it, this news did travel through the Muslim and Christian worlds. I mean, we have some mu Muslim authors who bewail it and, you know, uh, think, think, you know, oh my gosh, uh, uh, we've lost Jerusalem again. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Um, but they also emphasized that, in fact, the Christians only got control of some churches and some ruins. Well, that, yeah, that's what Al Kamil says. Yeah, to try to kind of like soften the, that. Yeah. You know, the shock. Because, because again, it's, it's like the details of this thing probably would have not been as apparent to the pop culture of the day, right? You know, just like oh. the average uh, Muslim or Christian out there, you know, working their field or whatever, yeah. or even, you know, the, the, the average nobility. Uh, so. Well, so yeah, think, and that, that, yeah. Go ahead. I think the significance is that you're right. That in the West, it was seen as the recovery of Jerusalem. In the East, the people looking at it who had to live with it, they look and say, "But well, we're not getting the castles back. We can't build fortifications. It's only a very narrow strip of land that's un indefensible from Jaffa to Jerusalem. We don't have control of the Temple Mount." So the people in Jerusalem, the barons, and the people of the crusader states understood very, very well that this treaty did not give them any, a, a, def, a defensible control of anything. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you yeah. have a very different reaction on the part of the people in the Latin East compared to the Latin West. Yeah. And, you know, I guess now we can talk a little bit about what actually was uh, agreed at this point. And, um, also, of course, to what extent Al Camille was really even able to give Jerusalem away, even at this point. I know at this by, the, by this point, Al Muazzam had uh, died, and he was involved in this uh, siege at Damascus to take control of Damascus um, from uh, Al Muazzam's heirs. And uh, you know, I guess Frederick does this little military demonstration where he marches to Jaffa and re fortifies it or, you know, rebuilds it. It had been, Jaffa had been um, in, in ruins for, you know, there were alternate periods where it, it was uh, uh, fortified and, you know, uh, destroyed during various conflicts. But, um, but yeah, and so Frederick does that because he's trying to uh, impress upon Al Camille that he needs to, to come to terms with him because Frederick is worried that uh, once uh, Al Camille has, Damascus, um, he won't have any reason to negotiate with him anymore. But yeah, the deal that they come up with is is very, it, it's very strange, uh, and uh, it, it it to me it just shows how much things have changed too, uh, in the geopolitical sense at this point in the medieval world from uh, from now up until when the Crusades began. Um, so the Crusaders supposedly they get. Uh, Jerusalem, Nazareth, and Bethlehem. So these, you know, religiously significant sites. And then there's this idea of a strip of land leading to the coast, right, oh, Helena? Yeah. Which to me is just kind of bizarre. It's only like, strips of newly, well, it's sort of like the Danzig Corridor. Think about, you know, before right. World War II. Um, these kinds of things can't work because a narrow corridor, which can be easily severed, is not defensible. And, you know, yeah, I think yes, it's pretty meaningless, but, but yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about exactly what they agreed to and, you know, how the, the barons of Outremer react? Well, it, it? The, the critical points I'm trying, I'm looking here, I've got, you know, the David Avilafia's biography of Frederick in front of me. And he's saying, in essence, Jerusalem lay exposed. Its tenure conditional merely on Alchemy's promise to Frederick. Nor indeed was all the Holy City in Christian hands. The Temple Mount was excluded from Frankish control. The al Mosque and the Dome of the Rock were among the holiest places of Islam and therefore retained by the, by the Muslims. Um, around Jerusalem was the settlements around Jerusalem under Muslim control remained under Muslim control. Hebron remained in non-Christian hands. Between Jerusalem and the sea, there would be a narrow, narrow corridor moving the city to the coastal towns. But again, 
no way of defending that. There was, again, and as we've talked about before, no control of the coast, the major fortresses on the former border. It's, it's all undefensible territory. It's only for 10 years, I think eight months, and I don't know how many days, because no Muslim treaty with, with infidels or non-believers could run longer than that. So it's not even returning. It's, as I put it, as he, they loan an undefensible Jerusalem to the Christians. They don't give them control of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 very strange, and um, I think you know really Al Kamil's uh, you know so-called propaganda piece that he put out, where he says, "Look, you know, I've, I really haven't given him given him anything. I mean, I've uh, this. We can easily retake this when the the treaty is over." I, I do think that pretty much uh, summarizes it, and yeah. um, it's it's a very different situation than what uh, you you know night and day yeah. what existed yeah. prior to eleven eighty seven. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, so the interesting thing too is the main conflict that takes place during the Sixth Crusade is once Frederick has made this deal with Al Kamil, and he has um, gone to the, uh, Jerusalem where he has his uh, crown wearing ceremony. Uh, the idea is that that Frederick is, you know, making the monarchy of. Uh, of Jerusalem, part of his, you know, many titles, uh, you know, as, as Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, that's how he viewed it, I think. And then when he goes back to Accra and gets ready to leave, uh, there's a lot of hostility between him and uh, the local establishments, like uh, the Templars, the Hospitallers, the Patriarch. And a lot of Italians. Who did not like him? <laughs> but, but, yeah, but you've got the peasants who actually support him. So you've got you've got the True. Italian conflict being played out in in Ultramar. So that the Genoese and the Venetians actually oppose Frederick, but the peasants support him. Yeah, yeah, and he's also got the Teutonic Knights who support him, and then uh, yeah. and obviously uh, th then there are some imperial forces you know hit, that support him. So so that you know there's that, um, but. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a really nasty kind of drama that plays out. Uh, Frederick ends up, and I think you know, this is where we see how poorly Frederick handles the entire situation. Uh, he ends up uh, attacking the, well, besieging the Templar uh, uh, bases at Accra and, and the Hospitaller uh, house there as well. So do you want to talk a little bit about that, Helena? I know this is you know, all stuff that um, plays a big part in your book. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. This actually goes back a little bit because, of course, we're talking now about the Sixth Crusade and we're leaving sort of clamored, at least sort of removed from the discussion, um, the the issues of, of Frederick trying to establish absolutist control over the Kingdom of Jerusalem, the Kingdom of Cyprus, because they're sort of independent of the Crusade. And they are two separate issues, but of course they intermingle because it's one person and it's the same period. But Frederick has come from Sicily with an idea that he's a, an emperor, and it's part of his conflict with the Pope, is that he sees himself as a Roman emperor with complete power. He is the new Caesar. He is a modern medieval Caesar with absolute control over everything. His word is law. He wants centralized government where he has the final say about everything, and he does not seek consultation with his. He's not feudal. He's he's in that sense. He is more modern. He is more Renaissance because he's moving away from the consultation and that governing by consent. He's moving towards a very absolute, centralist kind of government, which is legitimately why people called him very modern. I just question whether it's a positive direction. As I say, history is not lineal, and some moves may be more modern, but doesn't mean they were actually more uh, beneficial for the people being ruled. So throughout his period in the Latin East, he is also asserting his role as the suzerain of Cyprus, because Cyprus is part of the Holy Roman Empire at this time, and his role, he's claiming to be king of Jerusalem, although according to the constitution of Jerusalem, he's only weeping for his infant son. And in, that, in the course of making that claim, he, for example, just um, confiscates one of the Templar castles. Ah, Castle Pilgrim, it's mine now, you know. Thanks for building it. It was nice that you put all that effort and resources into it, but I'm the king of Jerusalem now and I want that castle. Templars didn't buy into that kind of stuff because they didn't owe allegiance to any king. 
whether he was king of Jerusalem or not. The Templars were not subjects of the king of Jerusalem. So even without taking into, into the debate of whether he was king or only regent, he had no right to take a Templar castle. So their hostility between uh, Frederick and the Templars has, mo has more to do with, has, has to do with many things, not just the fact that they see this, this crusade as a farce, and they're the ones who are going to pay the price of this indefensible border. Because like the patriarch of Jerusalem, Gerald, they realize that, as, you, as we were talking about, in the West, people say, oh, Jerusalem's now ours again. We can go to Jerusalem. And then the pilgrims flood in, and who's responsible for protecting them? The Templars. Right. And the Templars are going to be expected to bleed and die for all of these pilgrims, gone roads, which they cannot defend. So the Templars have are furious. And of course, to add the you know the icing to the cake, the temp the Templar headquarters was in the Alaska Mosque. So when they reserve that mosque for the Muslims and say no no the Christians can't even set foot on the Temple Mount, uh, it's like the Templars saying wait a minute <laughs> that's ours, you know you you just you just gave away our headquarters our you know center. So the Templar hostility to uh, Frederick II is enormous. And he goes back and confiscates all of the Templar, by the way, and all the hospitality properties throughout the Holy Roman Emperor, Empire. Mm -hmm. so the, the, yeah. He continues this vendetta for a while. I mean, then the Pope insists that he gives them back. And sometimes, so you know, two or three years later, he still hasn't given the Templar properties back, but eventually he does. And of course, the winners are the Teutonic Knights who are getting all his favor while he's out, while he's furious with the Templars and the Hospitallers. Yeah. Um the thing about Frederick's whole conduct in the Holy Land, to me, it, it does strike me that, you know, we don't we don't see in the history of the Crusades uh, other monarchs behaving this way. You know, when guys like Richard the First and Louis the Ninth of France come, and I mean, they uh, have respect for the local uh, feudal structures, and they, um, you know, deal with them uh, according to their traditions and their laws, and. Uh, Frederick shows up and basically says, okay, you all have to uh, completely submit to me and I don't care about whatever, you know, the previous legal structures are and I'm just going to, and, you know, it's my will, uh, I am, you know, the law type thing. And it really goes poorly. And yeah, it, it is uh, interesting. I mean, the, the kingdom of Jerusalem never reestablishes any kind of uh, uh, major presence in Jerusalem, you know, for the duration okay. of this treaty. I mean, Accra remains the capital. Um, that's, you know, where the, the Templars and the Hospitallers maintain their, uh, you know, their focus. Um, because, yeah, Jerusalem is, I mean, it's it was dangerous traveling uh, in the Crusader states throughout uh, their history. But, I mean, you know, trying to engage in a pilgrimage to Jerusalem during this period would have been incredibly dangerous. And I kind of wonder how that worked. Um, I, I, I uh, haven't really looked into a lot of accounts of uh, pilgrimage to Jerusalem in the uh, 1230s, but um, I don't know, you know, uh, if I, I, I've never read uh, much in, in, in regards to pilgrimages uh, during that time period, but I have read a little bit about uh, from uh, accounts of pilgrims, uh, from about, uh, I would say about the early 1300s to about the mid 1300s. Um, and all of them, almost, and, and even having uh, been to Jerusalem, uh, albeit uh, briefly about two years ago, um, the, the, the loss of Jerusalem in, I, I believe it was 1244, yeah. after, after this, yes. um, to, the, to the Khwarazmians, um, that is considered the that that is that's like the real uh like sack of jerusalem that everybody remembers um and the the apparently the Khwarazmians when when they came in i mean it was just it, it, like it was brutal on, on a scale that had not been repeated in a long time um and uh jerusalem to this day still shows the scars of that um, and I believe for quite a long time after that, Jerusalem was kind of in in a state of wreckage. It was. It, it was. It was. It was an absolute uh, backwater hellhole that uh, pilgrims in the early to mid 1300s who traveled there 
remarked on consistently that that Jerusalem was this it was like a ghost town um and there was hardly anybody living there and everything was destroyed um that there you know most of it was just ruins and graveyards and uh, and whatnot some of the some of the churches uh in Jerusalem, some of the christian churches in jerusalem still show the scars of of the Khwarazmians. um most notably the um uh, it's the big barrel vaulted uh, Norman church uh, outside. Uh, I think the I think the Eastern I think the, the Eastern Orthodox have it now. Um, it's out there right right next to the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, it's where uh, Queen Melisandre is alleged to have been buried. Um, the Chapel of the Dorm Mission, the Church of the Dorm Mission. Um, outside, it's this beautiful big barrel vaulted Norman style uh, church from from. Uh, I want to say the 1140s. Um, Queen Melisandre was the was the primary patron. That's why she was buried there. Um, but uh, the entire vault, if you look up, the entire vault is is black scorched, and there's all this carbon scorching uh, up in the up in the top of it. And according to the the custodians of it today, that 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 is it's carbon scoring. Uh, that's was from when the Quasmans came in in 1244. Um, wow. and, and there's and there's multiple other places in there that that they'll talk about that yeah that was to to the to the to the locals that's like the real sack of Jerusalem was in 1244 with the Quasmans. Yeah, this is a little passage from Tom Madden kind of his summary of how he views the 6th crusade. So he says it was not that Frederick struck a bargain to to acquire Jerusalem that so angered his contemporaries. If Pelagius had accepted the restoration of the Crusader states in 1220, the event would have been greeted with joy throughout Christendom. What Christians and Muslims alike considered reprehensible was the state of Jerusalem itself. With a stroke of a pen, the holy city was transformed from a citadel of faith into a defenseless bauble. Despite the assurances of Al Kamil and Frederick, Jerusalem could not meaningfully be said to be under Christian or Muslim control. Instead, it became a place where religion mattered so little that it no longer formed the basis of government. The holiest of cities had become a secular state. In the modern world, this is applauded as religious tolerance. In the medieval world, it was treason. Yeah. yeah. Interesting, interesting perspective from Madden. There. Yeah, it's, you know, it's very well stated. I, I think that's a very accurate assessment of, of the situation. Yeah. So yeah, we we've, we've really come yeah, to it. Yeah, go ahead, Helen. I, I just want to say that, that, that the Patriarch Geralt bases his attacks on this treaty, calling it unchristian, mainly because he foresees what happened. We talked about this in our last uh, podcast. He foresees that there are going to be Christians that go there, but they can't be defended and they're going to be slaughtered. And they are. That's what happens. That's the twenty thousand that are killed in twelve forty four. And it was foreseeable. And the yeah. Templars see it, foresee it, you know, the patriarch could, could foresee it. And you make a valid point that in the West, maybe they didn't see it, but in the Latin East, everybody understood that this is this is a, this is a, 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 a farce. This is not a real treaty. This is not a sustainable solution. This is not, this does not improve our security in the least. And it doesn't give us real control, which means we cannot really um, defend our faith as Thomas Adam points, in Jerusalem anymore. Because if we can't defend Jerusalem, if we can't protect it, we, we shouldn't be there. And if we're not there, then who? Then it does just become, you know, a wasteland. Yeah, I'm, I think we've really come to a point where, uh, you know, crusading is such an institution in the Latin West that, you know, you've got a monarch like Frederick II, who can see it as in in terms of a purely political ploy. You know, I think in earlier earlier eras, you know, certainly the First Crusade era, um, this was something that sprang out of out of piety, um, and that you know that sort of piety that influences the Crusades is still very much at play in the early 13th century. But it is interesting how it can kind of devolve into purely a a portion of a political strategy which you know clearly that's that's what was going on here with frederick i mean we, we like we talked about the whole time frederick was in the holy land he was kind of thinking more about uh stuff he had to deal with or he, his, things he was trying to accomplish in the west you know for richard the lionheart uh it was kind of this nagging thing he had to he, he wanted to focus on the holy land but he was 
kind of felt this nagging pull back to the West because his lands were being attacked by, um, you know, supposedly a fellow crusader. But for, for Frederick II, the crusade is just a sideshow for him to make a political point to, um, you know, undermine the, undermine the Pope. So, right. so what, what you really have, and what, we, what we're saying is that it's exact, this is why people see Frederick as a modern monarch. It's precisely because as you get into the Reformation and the Enlightenment, and there's a contempt for, religious, for religion and a particular hatred of the Pope, Frederick becomes the wonderful heroic figure who was so far ahead of his time that he already understood that religion was just a farce. And his, they attribute to him, you know, that, that Moses was Jesus and Mohammed were shysters that were uh, making f fools of their own followers. Um, I don't think he ever really said that, but in a way that encapsulate, encapsulates, people credit him with being so little interested in religion and having so little faith that he could say something like that. And that's what makes him modern. <laughs> but it's also what made him, you know, does it make him better? Is that, is, is, that, is that a view that we really want to subscribe to? This total cynicism about religion, re anybody's religion, as I say, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad all in the same boat. Yeah. Well, you know, well, and the, the thing is, I th and, I, and I think. Okay. Uh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Stephen. I didn't well, mean to run over you. Well, all I was going to say is, um, and I think that where these kind of modern uh, commentators, you know, are wrong is that Frederick disagreed with the Pope about the 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 dynamic between the papacy and the the empire, and you know the the. Uh, the role of the the emperor, but Frederick certainly didn't. You know, like uh, he still had uh, you know Latin Christianity as the official religion, of course, in his his domains. I mean, he was per he was willing to to uh, um, you know uh, persecute heretics and that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I, he, and, and, that, and that's exactly the point I was going to make. Was I, I, I think I, I think Frederick the Second's proto secularist values are vastly overrated in in modern in, in modern historiography i, I think they I, I think they 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 saw maybe some similarities of of ideological belief uh and and they sort of latched onto that and and played them up well, to be way bigger than they really were and also i mean he can you know he can uh think that the pope is wrong about the role of the papacy in the church and you know, still be um, a, a medieval Christian, and I think I think Frederick was ultimately a medieval Christian in his outlook. I think he, but and this is a a conflict between the papacy and the the emperor that that goes back pretty far. I mean, we've got a lot of emperors who think the Pope is overstepping his bounds in the the church. I mean, you know, Frederick's view seems to have been that the Pope was the clerical head of the church. You know, he's supposed to be in charge of the churches and the masses and that kind of thing. But I, Frederick, I am the head of Christendom. You know, I'm the, the Holy Roman Emperor. and um, which, is, which is the exact same attitude that Henry IV had uh, at the time of the First Crusade. Uh, the, yeah. the oft the the another oft excommunicated Holy Roman Emperor, you, you know, it, it's that you saw that multiple times. Frederick Barbarossa, um, you know, who's often lauded in in uh, Crusader circles because of his involvement in the Third Crusade, is is ultimately tragic involvement. But um, you know, he he and the Pope were locked horns multiple times, um, and, and so it, it, yeah, it's 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 interesting that. Uh, you know, and yes, Frederick II was a, was an interesting luminary in in certain areas. He was um, he was obviously very much a showman. Um, he he had a uh, he had a flair for um, he, he had a particular flair that that you don't typically see in in other uh, uh, medieval heads of state, particularly uh, Holy Roman emperors at that time, um, but. Ultimately, he really he wasn't that different, um, and and I think what what made him different is really more sort of a a, a propaganda effort on the part of modern of, of secular historians in in the modern era who I, I think play his uh, his supposed ambivalence towards religion uh, way more uh, than, than it actually was.
I mean, Rand, I agree with you 100%. I agree, and, and, I, and I think it's particularly evident in German historians who obviously when you start having German unification in the 19th century, they go and look back for some sort of a, a ruler that's similar to who they are now, which is someone who's unifying, you know, someone who, who wrote, rules the great empire, and mm -hmm. someone who's not Papist, because this was, a, remember, the new Kaiserreich was Prussian and very Protestant, and therefore yeah. anti-Papist. Um, so that there's an awful lot of, but you can say that practically about any history, that you can learn more about the age in which a history is written than about the period it's writing about. Because almost any history reflects, will go back and take history and try to use it for their purposes. So the idea that the 19th century historians is a crusade, seeing the crusades as early colonialism and justifying colonialism later. Exactly. Yeah. The colonialism. So that's a very, very common phenomena, and it's clearly something that's happened here with Frederick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, in terms of in terms of evaluating uh, Frederick's work in the Sixth Crusade, I think again, all we have to do is look at uh, 1244, and uh, before that, um, uh, 1239. Which you know, of course, it, we we oftentimes overlook the fact that uh, the Barons' Crusade shows up and kind of renegotiates a lot of this stuff in uh, uh, 1239, 1240. But ultimately, you know, it's clear that Jerusalem is not defensible. Uh, so, so, so yeah, this, this whole thing is, it's, it's a very strange, uh, uh, treaty that he makes. And, um, you know, one of the things he does is he, he's, um, he, he burns, uh, the siege equipment and some of the uh, military equipment of, of, uh, the crusader states before he departs because he is afraid they might break his, his treaty with, with Alchemil. Um, with good reason because they didn't sign it. They didn't agree to it. It was right. his treaty with Al Camille, and the Templars and the Patriarch immediately said, "Well, that doesn't bind us. Go right. home." Yeah. You know. Yeah, and then of course, on top of that, I mean, uh, a treaty with uh, one of the Ayyubid uh, princes seems like such a uh, a okay. uh, difficult thing to really pin down. I mean, again, this the constant shifting alliances, the shifting control of uh, you know one Ayyubid princeling has control of of this versus. You know that uh, you know Al Kamil does kind of uh, he is kind of uh, the uh, most powerful uh, of the Ayyubid figures uh, during this period, but but yeah, there, there's that as well. So okay, so that is uh, sort of our overall discussion about this. Um, I wanted to you know know if there's anything else you guys wanted to touch on uh, in terms of the Sixth Crusade. Uh, yeah, whoever wants to jump in there, go ahead, Helena. Just before we go on to any that overall, I'd just like to point out Richard the Third, Richard the First, sorry, in the Third Crusade, twice pulls back from Jerusalem because it's not defensible. Right. It's not unique yeah. to the city. You know, if you don't have the land around it, if you don't have control of the Transjordan castles, mm -hmm. Jerusalem is not defensible. And there's nothing that changes between eleven ninety one and you know twelve twenty eight with regard to that. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Um, you know, imagine how different the history of the Crusades would have been if uh, Jerusalem had just been established on the coast back in. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah, okay. So yeah, the, the Sixth Crusade, the the, the funny, uh, strange uh, stepchild of the Crusades. Um, it, it really is kind of the the, the redheaded stepchild. Uh, of, of the crusades um it, it's it's this it's this very bizarre interlude although one thing i would say that is interesting to look at immediately after the sixth crusade is the uh what some historians consider far more successful the baron's crusade um that that takes place uh immediately after uh i want to say in like the 1230s yeah 12, 1239 to 1240 are the dates yeah um and, and uh once Frederick's treaty ends, that one kind of arrives to reestablish another treaty. Exactly. Um, well, and, and they and they actually achieve some some very sustainable, uh, realistic um, uh, security for the, uh, you know, for the coastal yeah. territories. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things, one of the things I was looking at quotes about the Sixth Crusade, and you get this: "This achieved more than all the other crusades put together." And it's like, uh, no, that is close. The Fourth Crusade, by the way, took Constantinople and all of the Greek Empire. Yeah, 
the, the German crusade of 1197 uh, gets the coast to Beirut and makes up the continuous coast up to the county of Tripoli. You know, yeah. you have one crusade after another. This is practically the only crusade that didn't actually gain control of territory, that didn't actually have conquests because yeah. It's only these these weak uh, promises from Alchemist. Well, well, like you said, it, it, the, the entire thing was all for show. Um, it, it was all kind of a smoke and mirrors yep. uh, piece of uh, political street theater that uh, really had its roots in uh, the, the emperor trying to one up uh, the Pope. Um, yeah. And that was it. That, that's really all it was about. And I'm just going to correct myself real quick. Uh, Barron's Crusade is 1239 to 1241. Okay. So one okay. more year in there. But um, yeah, uh, and I've, I have seen that so many times, Helena. Like when you're looking through these little like, uh, you know, the Crusades for Kids or whatever, some little summary page <laughs> that like is out. And it'll say something like that. Frederick, uh, through a bloodless, you know, treaty. Yeah, yeah it's just, I mean. That's the thing about medieval history or history in general. It's like, it's so complicated. And, you know, people try to reduce it to these little sound bites that, you know, when you don't have any basis of knowledge in the first place, those sound bites are just, they're, they're, they may as well be on Mars. I mean, it's just so wrong. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think, um, well, I have to say, uh, I, I, to me, the, if, if we can talk about heroes and villains in history, I think the heroes of the Sixth Crusade are uh, you know, the, the Patriarchate, uh, the Templars, the military orders, the, yeah. the local barons, and they're kind of maintaining some integrity. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, a, a formidable integrity to the Crusader states in the face of this ridiculous farce that Frederick brings to bear on, on uh, the, the territory. And, you know, Throughout the long history of Crusader Outremer, there were so many efforts to raise the adequate forces from the West that you know so often came to nothing. It is really incredible what uh, you know the small military establishment that uh, controlled the coast, and um, especially you know if we're talking about the post Third Crusade era, uh, what they were able to achieve, you know. Uh, with with what the what what resources they had available to them, with pretty much I think we could say throughout the history of Outremer, they they were never given the support they they really needed from the West. So, those are my thoughts on that. With the possible exception of of the Seventh Crusade, which is something we should do a podcast on as well. I mean, it just and and making the contrast again between Frederick the Second and Louis the Ninth, mm -hmm. who was totally dedicated to the Holy Land. And he yes. failed ultimately, and he wasn't Richard the Lionheart, but it was not because he did not have a commitment or because his agenda was something different. Yes, and uh, the the local establishment absolutely embraced him, and he, he yep. acts, yeah, and he, he acts as de facto ruler. And in fact, it's really fascinating. Those uh, four or so years after the fighting is done in Egypt, when he's, you know, uh, helping to build up the military establishment of, of Outremer, that's kind of where he really does his best work. And, but yeah. without ignoring the, the high court or Absolutely. the locals, he does it by working with the systems in place and working with the people rather than trying to impose an, an external imperialist um, regime. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah. Any uh, final thoughts, anybody? Or anybody want to launch into a whole other topic? I mean... Scott's been very quiet. Scott? I've just been listening, Helena. Yeah, Scott, what do you think about the Sixth Crusade? What are your, what are your overall thoughts? Well, I just think it was a mess. Yeah. <laughs> when you get right down to it, nothing was really achieved. And, you know, uh, I, I, I don't know. Maybe – before the the we started the the cast here, I was of the opinion that it was already lost, or, or yeah, that well maybe it's still it was already what was to be gained was already lost by the time the whole thing started. You know, the, I, I, I you know reading about Pelagius and 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 the the the, the offers to uh, um, get a um, you know, the offers of the return of Jerusalem, considerable territory and the way these were rejected and, and 
Yeah. Uh, it, it just seems that they ended up just in a much, you know, by the time Frederick even got there, they were in just a horrible situation. Yeah. The, yeah. the fifth crusade was a mess too. And, a lot of that, I mean, there was yeah. a mess there to begin with and 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 a lot of that was frederick's fault mm -hmm. if for not, not getting now that's where i'm not making the, the connection yet i guess is, is you know where he okay he was supposed to be there and supposed to all right. He was supposed to lead it, and he kept telling yeah. them that he was on the way. And and, and, uh, and, and, and the lack of his leadership, or or well, it didn't turn. It, I you know, part of me almost, part of me kind of wonders if his leadership was even what was really needed. Um, yeah, that's I guess because I, I was getting at Rand. Yeah, kind of the the way he the way he acted when he actually did show up. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not convinced that that's, uh, um, that, that that's what would have, uh, enabled the fifth crusade to succeed. I, I think yeah, what, they, well, what could yeah, have enabled the sixth crusade to succeed thing. was, yeah, what, well, what could have enabled the fifth crusade to succeed was to have, uh, a, a leader with the military acumen of, a, of, of a Richard the first, um, or, or, or something that was comparable, um, to recognize that, you know, Hey, you know, solidify your gains on the coast. Maybe, you know, uh, execute the same strategy. And, and some of this is a little bit of a historical armchair quarterbacking, but you, you know, yeah. it, it, you know, um, solidify your re repeat the same strategy Richard conducted in Palestine, which is secure the coast, cut off sea, cut off maritime access um, to the Egyptians, and and you know, take Alexandria, take take the major port cities, to, you know, all that sort of thing. And then once you solidify that, then start working your way inland. You know, unfortunately, you see this over and over again with both the Fifth Crusade and uh, Louis the Ninth's Crusades uh, into Egypt. You you see this uh, headlong rush into the interior of Egypt, um, and and they're they're unsupported. They they're too easily cut off. Um, that you know the 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 topography is against them. Uh, and, and things like that. It, it, is it was it maybe just an unwinnable situation from the or scenario from the get go? Maybe I I don't know. Um, but but Rand, I to be to give credit where it's due and to be fair, John de Brin, who was the the king of Jerusalem at the time, was in favor of that. He opposed the and and the big problem if you read the biography of Brin, which of course biography of Brin is on his side, says that that was the big problem that because Frederick was coming and because the Pope can Pelagius that. Brienne wasn't allowed to be the actual. There was no single commander. Ah, yeah. And and that right. there and 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 the commander that they did have, the cardinal, was not a military man. So yeah. The, the two, the biggest problems with the Fifth Crusade was that they didn't have a unified command, and that command was not in the hand of somebody with military experience. Yeah. Yeah, it's really so, too bad that the resources. Yeah. It's too I mean, bad the resources. Yeah. Could, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, it would have been, it would've been better. It would have been better if the resources of the Fifth Crusade had probably been in the hands of John de Brienne. Yes. Because he exactly. was the most militarily capable commander there. And uh yeah. Um He may the, not have been Richard the Lionheart, but he would have at least had a, a more rational military idea of what had to be done. And he had, you know, actually quite good reputation. As I say, I know whether he could have succeeded or not is, you know, we'll never know. But it certainly would have been better than what they had, where you have Frederick II sending the Duke of Bavaria, I believe, and, and you know, the Pope sending Pelagius, and and no, and nobody paying attention to Brienne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's well, in terms of the strategic issues involved, I think Jerusalem was kind of an impediment in terms of, you know, since it was such, a, it was the emotional fixation. I mean, exactly. Imagine like uh, establishing a very firm control of the coast of Egypt. Like, you know, you, you get control of cities like Damietta and Alexandria and you kind of dig in, like you dig your heels in and support it with Cyprus. And then you control the whole, whole Palestinian Syrian coast. I mean, that could have been potentially a long term strategy to, you know, uh, create economic disadvantages yeah. for, well know. and 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 at the time the 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 two of the most important cities in egypt in medieval egypt were the cities on the coast um that that's kind of been egypt's uh history 
even up into even all the way up into the, the 20th century. Um, the, the, some like the most important cities are the cities on the coast, because as you go further inland, uh, unless you are literally right next to the Nile, um, it's a desert and, and there's right. nothing there. And, um, you know, it, the, the, the most important part of Egypt was the northern half, which is which is the Nile Delta. Um, and had the Crusaders established a territorial control of that, uh, Egypt would have been handicapped forever after um, because all they would have been left with was literally just the Nile. And they couldn't even go all the way up into the Delta because the, hopefully, you know, it, the, presumably the Delta would have been controlled by a hostile power. So the problem, the problem is that the, the Crusaders wanted Jerusalem. Right. And control of, the control of the coast of Egypt could only be a point of leverage. That's what Richard yeah. wanted it for, too. It's to try to force the Ayyubids into surrendering Jerusalem, but not just Jerusalem, but the surrounding territories that would yeah. make Jerusalem sensible. It's trying to get back the old borders of the kingdom. But that won't work once the Ayyubids have split. It mm -hmm. would have worked when Richard was king. It would have worked because Saladin controlled both. Mm -hmm. And Saladin preferred Damascus to Egypt. Saladin would have sacrificed Egypt for Damascus because his roots and his emotional ties were to the north of Syria. Well, but, but Egypt was you his power base, though. Yeah, he, his, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 honestly, I think Saladin. Would, I think that would have been a very hard. I think that's why Richard had the, had Egypt as his target because while while Damascus may have been Saladin's uh, emotional uh, power base, that his his real financial, economic, and and logistical yes. power base was Egypt. Yes. So, but the point is that's why you could attack Egypt, and and Saladin would be would 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 say, I can give you I can give you Jerusalem because. He could afford to to he controlled them both. But if you start attacking later, Al Kamil doesn't control Jerusalem. So the whole yeah. time you attack Egypt, you can't. You're not actually attacking the person who legally controls it. Well, I think that what Richard's strategy and Louis the Ninth strategy was: uh, get control of Egypt, make it, you know, make it into a Frankish territory, you know, basically. And then you will have the economic power and the strategic position and all that stuff to control Jerusalem. I mean, I don't think, um, you know, I don't think R Richard was thinking or Louis were thinking, well, well, we'll invade Egypt and then we'll be able to trade it for Jerusalem. I think the idea was we, the, fr the Frankish world needs to control Egypt. Like Latin Christendom mm -hmm. needs to gain control of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that was quite sensible. But I guess one thing I'm I'm wondering about is would it have been possible to just kind of establish control of part of Egypt? Like let's make the coastal part of Egypt into, you know, a Frankish power yeah. base. And well, just I think that was the uh, I think that was the I think that was the the, the thinking of uh, uh, Peter of Cyprus uh, in in the 14th century when he made his raid on Alexandria. I think I think maybe there was some ideas that. Uh, you know, hey, maybe we can turn this into a kind of a Frankish power base, you know, kind of a, a, a Latin power base. Um, and it, he, he very quickly realized that he did not have the, the men or the material to, to be able to hold it. So he, he just turned it into a kind of a glorified raid. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I think there was there, there was that thinking. I think I think everybody maybe sort of looked at what Richard did in Cyprus and was sort of like, hey, this can work. You know, let, let's. Well, but Cyprus was was very very Christian, very Byzantine. True. And Alexandria and northern Egypt was not. So it's it's a lot more problematic. And it, as you say, Almoric, of course, has failed three or four times in the at the height of Crusader power. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that the idea wasn't using it as a means of of forcing Jerusalem to swallow. Well, or, that's or, may, or maybe it was something in between. Maybe it was more, uh, you know, like sort of, you know, what we, uh, you know, even even uh, in the Marine Corps with our, you know, maneuver warfare doctrine that we still preach to this day of taking the fight to them. You know, maybe maybe remove remove the fight away from where we are, are you know, where we are, and and take it to them. I. Maybe I, I don't know. Um, I, that's, that's how I kind of saw it. You know, you know, 
the economics, because the economics of it is, of, is clear. You don't want to be fighting in your streets and your territories because exactly. you're going to lose the economic base. So you want to take it more to them. So they're having the economic negative. They're having the negative yep. economic consequences. Yeah. Great stuff, guys. We get to talk about it another time. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting topic. <laughs> um, and then one thing, of course, uh, in, in the middle of the 13th century, this all kind of changes because the Mongol nations really screw up the, the, the Near Eastern uh, yes. trade route. Right. So, so that is that, my friends. Uh, I do want to recommend everybody pick up a copy of Helena Schroeder's Rebels Against Tyranny, which is her awesome uh, drug Barons of Outremer and Frederick II. Uh, I've read it, read it. It's good stuff. Um, Scott, you liked it, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I finished last night. Very good. <laughs> so write a review. Need a review. Need lots of reviews. Positive reviews. Am I allowed to plug my book? Absolutely. Here? Absolutely. No, no, no. It. You're not allowed. <laughs> 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 of course. <laughs> yes, please do. You know, there's there's really is only one bad review on on, on um, re, um, Amazon right now. But oh, it's not from it's not from her, is it? Sorry. No, it's not, it, no, it's her. not from her. No. Okay. But all right. what's interesting is that I've got really really rave reviews from some of the highbrow, some of those the Kirkus reviews, which normally sneers at me because I'm writing about top not politically correct topics. Made this calls the main hero is it's like Shakespeare's. Young Hal, oh. I like being compared to Shakespeare. Wow. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Wow. And and Blue Ink, which is another one of sort of highbrow reviewers, also came, theirs hasn't been published yet, but they've given me the pre copy, and it's also very very positive, very flattering. Nice. Nice. So I'm getting I'm getting good critical reviews, as I say. So I want more people to you know readers go out there and okay. put their opinions up. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so uh, this has been our live stream about uh, the Sixth Crusade. So we appreciate everybody being with us, and um, we will be doing something again shortly. So uh, Roman Empire's uh, channel tomorrow for a uh, for a little live stream, so you can check that out if you want. And then on Wednesday, I'm thinking we'll do a little uh, get uh, another thing from Thirsty Marine if uh, Scott and Rand are up for it, so. Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. All right. Okay, guys. Everybody soon for being with us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.